it, it is truly late uh, for all of us. Right now, I've been away for three months, so right now it's almost two o'clock in the morning for me where I've been living for three months. I got in last night, so bear with me. Uh, what I'd like to do is read a little bit about a particular form that I think um, LA, Los Angeles, I, I guess I've become an Angelino in the same way I was born and raised like Jen in San Francisco, in the North Beach area of San Francisco. And, you know, we bristle when anybody calls it Frisco. And I bristle when people call it LA now. I like to call it Los Angeles in any case. Um, what I'd like to do is just read a little bit about a certain aspect of my practice in Los Angeles, and it has to do with daily life, which I think in Los Angeles, for many reasons, and we don't have the time to go into it at the moment, for many reasons is, is, in, is in most ways, I think, more fundamental to poets in Los Angeles than it is in most other places. One, because there isn't the distraction necessarily uh, of the public world, not the public world in general, uh, but the public world of poetry as there is in other places, certainly the place where I grew up in San Francisco. Um, and so one of the things that I've done over the years, the last 20 years or so, uh, that I find myself coming back to over and over again, is the alphabet and how this alphabet, uh, and, and, and I don't mean just the Roman alphabet, but the things that went into making the Roman alphabet, like the Semitic alphabet, um, how these things are, are, to me, fundamental to poetry. And I'd like to read from uh, something I wrote for a conference, of course, not in our own country, but in Paris back in 2006 about Los Angeles poetry. So LA poets talked about it, <clears throat> and LA historians, and et cetera, et cetera, and of course, French writers. And I guess in 2006, uh, France had just discovered there was such a thing as Los Angeles, people wrote in it. Um, but anyway, and I wrote something for it, I wrote about several things, but I'm just going to read the part I wrote about uh, the alphabet, and then I'll read you five alphabet, short alphabet poems. Uh, <clears throat> also, I had a cold for about the last, it was the coldest summer on record in, in, in Europe, in North Vietnam, and uh, so it, it rained all of July and August, I got there in August, and then suddenly it got hot, and then the last two weeks I was there at one stretch it rained every single day. So, of course, I had several colds and several coughs and all of that. But anyway, I'm back home. Um, poetry for me, Issues from the Invisible City. And this happens to be the name of a magazine, as, as Brian read earlier, that uh, I did from 1971 to 1982 that was published in Los Angeles and San Francisco. Poetry for me then issues from the invisible city, the big nowhere that is Los Angeles. Ours is a city of theatrical impermanence, as Christopher Isherwood called it, the home of tautological architecture where hot dog and hamburger and donut stands take on the shape of hot dogs and hamburgers and donuts, where at any given time only a little more than one third of the population has lived there for more than five years. Los Angeles is blessed, in Tennessee Williams' words, with wonderful rocking horse weather and a curious light to mesmerize, and a curious light so mesmerizing that, as Orson Welles once noted, you sit down, you're 25, and when you get up, you're 62. It functions, according to the poet Thomas McGrath, as the Asia Minor of the intellect, a place where, in the immortal words of the legendary producer Irving Thalberg, namesake, for the Academy's Oscar Lifetime Achievement Award. The writer is no less than a necessary evil. Los Angeles is also a place that has afforded writers and artists, to borrow a phrase from a longtime resident, Igor Stravinsky, has given us splendid isolation. Memory in so willfully forgetful a place is critical, defining an almost palpable dimension of daily life which is all the more vivid in contrast to the perpetual elsewhere that best describes my writing practice here. Um, I came to Los Angeles in 1968. I 
spent the first 22 years of my life in San Francisco, and then I spent a year at Trinity College in Dublin, and then I came here. And I've been more or less in the same northeast corner of Los Angeles, Echo Park, Silver Lake, for, since 1968. And I want to talk about the alphabet now. I'm going to move forward. It's a day of excerpts, I guess. There is nothing more ordinary, mundane, and material to the practice of writing as the alphabet. Also, there is not a technology as fundamentally telling to the human condition, especially in such a dislocated environment as Los Angeles. In short, these alphabets afford a meditative structure that is at once personal and public, temporary and historical, in which to house my verse. Here, in number 15 of Day Shadows Pass, the 26-line poem beginning by taking stock of yet another day of tending to the ordinary motion of life beyond the desk where the poet watches and waits for something no more uncommon than the next line dictated by the next missing letter of the alphabet. These are all made up uh, like the Perec novel without a certain letter, like the letter E. These poems go from A to Z and in poem A, in the first poem, there is no A in poem B. And this is just an excerpt from that poem. Orchid or mockingbird or plenty, plenty heat and smell of jasmine or squeaky hummer, a trilling something. I can't read this far away. Let's try it again. Orchid or mockingbird or plenty, plenty heat and the smell of jasmine or squeaky hummer, a trilling something or other like an alarm gone berserk in the trees across the way. August full-blown noon and blinding is the sound of mailman setting his emergency on the hill outside beyond the fenced-in garden. Number, oh, audacious number, show your melody doubled as pale fate, genuine and large, or largely motion. In the description of poetic daily life where house or house is indeed the operative term, Given the constant embarrassment of survival, I use daily life or the quotidian more often than not in a mock heroic manner to find common forms to supplant some of the social functions of narrative. In supplanting or more ingenuously trying to seduce narrative, one wishes to accommodate that most wicked and unhappy and happy of creatures, time. Time and place operate curiously in the daily and often dull ineptitude of a grammar that might describe such a fictive utility as Los Angeles. Time, for instance, as briefly noted, may function as a property of light, a perpetual present or timelessness in close relationship to the peculiarly isolate and meditative light that is the single most distinguishing characteristic of our city. Lots and lots of light and no shadows, notes artist Robert Irwin. Really peculiar, almost dreamlike. Inhabiting this light, then, is the citizen who recently, near the corner of Sunset and Alvarado, was shouting at the rush hour traffic, what the fuck are you looking at? Or no less enthusiastically, what the hell are you doing here? The same place, parenthetically, where Muhammad Deeb said his poem from L.A. trip, intersection, Sunset, and Alvarado. Or there was the barefoot stranger a few years ago, bearing a mop and empty bucket across Hollywood Boulevard, pausing in the crosswalk in front of my car to say that he knew me and knew what I was doing there. I'm suggesting that a preoccupation with our daily bread is a poet's attempt to ground his or her work, if not exactly in some form of realism, at least in a realistic attitude or position within this wacky environment. Lacking the public occasion, and certainly the public forum for serious literature, museums and other educational and public institutions in our city are hardly more than specimen boxes in today's cultural marketplace. Some poets instinctively employ the daily to create a context for their work, social, dramatic, or otherwise. In a city where the image is considered truthful and entrepreneurs the likes of fill in the name of whatever current pop culture boss are discussed in university and college classrooms as if creative geniuses, a poet may look to his or her own isolate daily life to fashion a background 
against which language may be given room for serious play. And I go on, of course, to, to talk more and more about play and what that means in terms of um, language. But rather than go on, and it is late, I'll give you some examples of what I'm talking about. <clears throat> this is from a book. Um, this is, I, I, I've done about seven books of alphabet poems. And this is from um, a book called Two, which there are two poems in this book, two longer poems. And uh, the end of this sequence uh, in two, you know, I could think of nothing further away from daily life in Los Angeles than uh, medieval churches. So the, the whole sequence is called Alabaster. And it has to do with the names of various things in churches. Some of them are really fascinating names. Um, and you know, once you know the name, oh yeah, you've seen it. You know, when you went to Europe or you saw a copy here in, in a church. But um, it's, it's really interesting what the things are called. So I'm going to do the V W X Y Z, right, the ending of this thing. And it has a particular form. Um, you'll, you'll hear it um, <clears throat> in, in these where um, letters of, of the alphabet are used at the beginning of each line and repeat and move around music like, like that. Anyway, you'll hear it. And I, I wrote a short note, about a short paragraph, about why I did this. And I'm not convinced now that this has anything to do with these poems that I did. I wrote, them after the, I wrote the note after the fact because the publisher wanted the note um, to explain what this thing was all about. So here's the note. I mean, I feel, I, I do feel about the first sentence here in this statement. I mean, everybody has said this, at least that I heard in the last session, five, four different ways, now, including myself. Um, and Seshu said it eloquently at the beginning, you know, all the things we fought for, all the things we did, if they're, you know, exactly the other things are happening, you know, the things we fought against are happening today. Um, so it starts in much that way. These are times of vast constraint. Our once energetic pluralism has been transformed into a dire self-censoring urge for consensus and appropriate forms of behavior. I have, however, been moving outside the approved forms toward a different vision of language, an alphabetic burlesque of constraint, as in the sequence alabaster. Here the text resists with words speaking in place and time at once language's conscience and its promised land. To paraphrase Orson Welles, this must be Los Angeles. My horoscope at breakfast told me to choose words carefully when speaking about myself. You could also say when speaking to myself. The first one is called voluntary. And a voluntary, some of you may know, is, uh, is soul organ music occasionally improvised that is played usually before or sometimes during or after a church service. It's played all the time, I guess. <clears throat> Voluntary. About blessings parenthetical screaming in the mud. Baseball absolutely demands if not sanctifies the weight. Cover both, my love, with the lull of our tender drifting. Doubt claims eternity, not the bush tits fucky. Excuse me, let's try that. Doubt claims eternity, not the bush tits fucky squeaking. <laughs> try it again. <laughs> I have fallen asleep. I took a nap this afternoon and it got me out here, but let's try it again. About blessings, parenthetical script. One, one gets trapped, of course, <laughs> <one's an alphabet. laughs> in one's own forms, right? That's what's happening. About blessings, parenthetical screaming in the mud. Baseball absolutely demands, if not sanctifies, the weight. Cover both, my love, with the lull of our tender drifting. Doubt claims eternity, not the bush tits fussy squeaking. Each day redeems the leaky song of presiding cliches. From every device only alibis remember to ring. Green fire under the mountain tops, armor, not your heart. Ay, 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 ay. Going, going, gone, the corazon of an action. Hark, hark, it's not just dogs howling in shadows. 
Jericho, in any case, is projected just east of downtown. Keeping jargon in charge slightly lessens the sway of hips. Lingering knowledge of whatever terse genuflection. Mild, low pressure and light winds find June softly eternal. No more what bird song he thinks, floating black cat's sleepy form. Or now the two butterflies chasing among half-lit guava. Peculiar options resist something less than bucolic or quintessentially parochial in weighing Sunday reasons, quite apart from chance, for the adventure of surviving rightly or wrongly a most outlandish romance. There said it all, he thought, warblers out mewing the dogs. Unless echoes count the passing as well as the coming, Victory upends the arrogant poverty of your claim with vague lessons of trust, emptiness as a way of singing. Expect what you will. Each hill feels like a pleasure taken. Yet, exactly now, still minding a chalice in that last chance, zip, zap, longing no better sometimes than lying. This one is called Wafer. I ingenuously define it as a small, thin disc of unleavened bread used in the sacrament of the Eucharist. Of course, wait for me, you know, wait for me, wait for me. There are all kinds of plays on this, and as you can see, I'm one not above playing with these sounds. And it was really interesting. I got totally trapped in the underlying text of another thing. You know, <laughs> the, the land, you know. the, the, <clears throat> my, my friend Mohammed Deeb, who I mentioned before, who was an Al uh, Algerian poet who was imprisoned in Algeria by the French in 1957 and then escaped to France. That's the curious part of history, because it's, if you know about the whole Algerian War. He came here in 1974, and many years later he wrote a, a long poem narrative poem about his visit in 74. He wrote it right before he died in between 99 and 201. Um, Dean used to, he loved Los Angeles and he loved Los Angeles because he felt every time you turned a corner, it was a particularly, there was a particularly new, he called them petite histoires, you know, little, some little history that was about to happen. And uh, Deeb always insisted in his poetics, that the poem reads you. You don't, I mean, if the poem is working, it reads you, you don't read it. And he meant, he meant first the poet, first of all, and of course, the reader as well. Wafer. Alternately, alternate. <clears throat> thought there was, it was really easy to sit out here and listen to the rest of you um, and not fall asleep. I, I've only, I, I remember, I, once I had the good fortune to teach seven classes when I was a, what they used to call a freeway flyer. And I taught, one of them I couldn't turn down, two of them I couldn't turn down. There were two poet in residencies. One was in San Diego and UC San Diego and the other, the other was here at Occidental College and they played. They paid twice what I was getting paid at Otis and LA City College. And I remember I, twice I fell asleep while lecturing. <laughs> I swear, my students, I used to have <clears throat> uh, students with English as a second language, and so they would take my lectures so they could play them back. They would take, right? And I fell asleep for about two minutes. Of course, I mean, I heard the tape. I didn't stop lecturing, but I, I was not conscious. <laughs> you know, that's at a point when you've been teaching too long. <laughs> Wafer. Alternating blessedly the cosmos inside and out, beyond any glint of remorse in a company town, casually born of cynicism, kneeling in the sun. Daddy calls to say that lions are infiltrating your chance. Early data might indicate a too, too solid figure, even for romance. Fail eventually where you must. Gossamer first applies those certain accidents of birth, hilariously gratuitous with wings like harvest moons, infinitely hesitant to advance one's last contrivance. Juggle increasingly what the weather must be before wanting knowledge, 
just of the crime, the motive basically a lingering keepsake of an ill-timed competition, mere longing for which doesn't inspire confidence or nothing more sublime. Chop chop on company time, the empire of nonchalance is now confined to clouds in your pants. Purple onion and an echoing dance where a turning stair was quite possibly accommodated. Who can believe that the right question won't tow barges past the river god, big and solemn, rolling breathtakingly to a salty end? This sure beats wondering about the top of the stairs, undoing that meager sense of childhood in a leering face, very unusual for the afternoon, that heartache without variation, three or four consultations for extracting which disappointment likely to rub the most. Yes, exactly a second stringer lost in a dream. Who is you, zanier, yes, excluding chance than anyone may fathom? This one is called Zistus, and the Zistus, X Y T T U S. And was I pleased to find this word? And it really exists. You look it up in the OED. X Y S T U S. It's an open colonnade or walk planted with trees used for recreation and conversation in a medieval church and monastery. Almost in that happiest place, teasing rain from wrong, but gladly will not, as we are much too jubilant to care, there being some 50 variations of warblers, oh, don't stop, please. The shadows are no longer at the door. Even so, Mysterioso, near jumping at the moon's fading correspondence, the very delirium, gentlemen in clichés, forever humble, my dear half-lit Susanna, our elders expose their wrinkled joy and nonchalance, their emptiness expert in that tempo. Jiggle your heart a while, like leopard sin ablaze with knowing hunger, downright ransom in our wilderness. Let anyone enter. Your smile a window to my abstinence, more from alibis or silence than disillusion. North by far of those omnivorous Nevadas every day occupied by the dizzy chan chan of desert winds. Promise no empty paradise of judgment without some quite tender crime of complicity on our frontier of repetition. A mauve dawn, not quite the likeness of skin, willing the comforting and luscious distances to approaching this memory of absolving time. I'm usually restless in my desire to step the house, voicing the shades, the common evil that dares prophecy. Who comes and goes, only a matter of lemons in the fog. X looks delirious with longing for your dreamy boulevards. You can deny it. The afternoon's perfectly angled to zigzag our play, our careless dancing almost faithfully. The second to the last one is called yes. It's, it's a, obviously, it's a word very uh, common to most religious practices. And I don't think it needs a definition. Yes. An impulse, a crowded dream brightening without flame, besides an appetite chancing everyday delirium, chasing the giddy inside hungriest for kisses. Dallying in a certain light, anonymous doorways, empty globe downtown circles the high, brief its ceiling. Facing the echo twice, he cases the beautiful ambush galaxies away, howling memory, leaning on heart-sore Lazarus's more than obliging opinion or itchy purgatories quickly resembling a stranger, juggling lemons minus nostalgia for starry nights. Keeping close to the wall, he slips between the curtains, listening for a step or the feel of air near the open passage, mockingbirds somewhere nattering an olden prophecy. No, he knew the chase of that darling flesh, everything of the whisper, the wounded smile, the crowd of sinners passing justice, peeking from lowered eyes as they enter quietly the flowing house. Laconic mountaintops or curt rows of tantalizing tomatoes or mashed potatoes, something, something, the simple life. 
as he kisses the hands of those two graces on the couch with brown silly dog, urgently given the sanctity of returning home, vainglorious tabernacle that he might spill now. With that unsatisfied wound, that wilderness in his heart, Exactly willing the ding, 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 a linga. Yes, with your work and someone who loves you genuinely much. Zip, zap, pretty blue skyline, outpacing the elemental. And the last one I'm going to read is called Zucchetto. And a Zucchetto is the, the Roman Catholic priest form of a yarmulke. Okay, a little black thing they have. I think the Cardinals have a red one, the Pope has a white one. Zucchetto, a slow light that is more than clarity, a little like admitting your tender opposite, bleary-eyed and victorious at least where strings of lilies and lions meet, admitting broken contrivances, elements long ago faded from the dusty, bitter night, the negation of all that promises to win us home. Ah, yeah. How almost willingly ordinary as friends or what someone else is typically doing this very morning, rum tum tum, without skin. Things in play, west on Beverly, east on Beverly, before dreaming any future place. Ablaze with alabaster, one must admit, as long as there is near music kicking around nowhere more winsome than in the outlandish passage from April to California, Sunday to Jose, March to French, and all the wilderness and September's in between. Slow ghost thicket, a tempo of someone's own. Please, please, the quintessentially ready-made and risen stranger, the tremor in the house, rather than some unfinished crime without dragon or alibi in the drowsy garden. Oh, savage, oh, brightening Niagara, O oh, briefest fussy thing in ruffled light, wait, I'm a stranger here myself. Anyway, thank you. Thank you.